Donc, we will uh, talk this morning on drug development. I, I apologize for the people working exclusively on CL because I will focus on really on VL for the reason I mentioned Monday. It's really the, the most severe form of the killing disease. I think that's really the priority. But I don't want to say that people working on CL are wrong. We need you also. Okay, just to remember what we said at the introduction on Monday, um, we are focusing on two different uh, major foci for VL. One is India, Nepal, Bangladesh. We could put Sri Lanka. <laughs> it's a really uh, homogeneous uh, uh, focus with one single parasite, one single vector. It's Donovani, Argentipis. It's a man-to-man -man transmission and a highly focused disease Pay domestic transmission, and the consequence is the frequency of big epidemics. That's the slide we, we saw previously. The typical environment with the cow, the cow dung, the breeding site for the vector, all the conditions are for, unfortunately are there to facilitate the transmission to humans. And that's a very old picture from uh, Professor Siam Sunda for Baranasi. I took it in a in BR hospital. There were so many cases at that time. We were talking on more than 90,000 cases per year at that time. And um, I asked, arriving from Geneva, it was my first visit to India. Could I see some cases of BS? We have plenty. <laughs> and we went to the hospital. And even there were two, three patients per bed, in the same bed, because not enough bed for, for uh, so many cases. And you see sometimes even family cases with the father and children. And all you can notice have not only splenomegaly, but hepatomegaly, most of them. Big, huge uh, splenomegaly. And the second big focus is East Africa, Sudan, Kenya, um, Somalia, Uganda, <laughs> Ethiopia. But it's a more complex situation. We won't insist, we already talked on that, but you have two different parasites, Infantum and Donovanite. It's mostly anthroponotic, but we have places where the transmission is, is very zoonotic, with animal reservoir, and um, there are two different vectors, Orientalis and Martinari. The transmission is different, not only in Pradomiciary, but also outside, even in the field. You have a very highly dispersed habitat, it's not uh, so focused as uh, India and Asia. And um, the problem we mentioned just before, the seasonal migration of people going from one area to the other because they are moving with the cattle uh, on seasonal uh, um, habit. And also you have severe epidemic. That is uh, one poster with the Acacia seyan, this typical uh, red trunk, and you see the Ideal condition for transmission, people sitting around the, the trees, and the, that's during the day, but also during the evening and the night sometimes. The transmission is very related to some uh, environment condition. Let's talk on drugs. Currently, we have this drug available. We have the, the wall one that's a pentavalent antimonia. This is a pentostam. We have also the megalimine antimoniate. Um, we have more recently the paramomycin that is also injectable intramuscularly. And you have uh, this unique oral drug, multifosine, oh. and uh, one IV, that's the embisome. So okay, we'll talk a little on these different drugs, but mainly the, um, how they were developed and in which conditions. Here you have a, a synthesis, it's a little dense <laughs> uh, slide, but uh, quickly let's see. We have here on the left the two antimonials, megalumine, antimoniate and sodium stiboglyconate. Both are pentavalent antimonials. Um, you can see usually intramuscularly uh, inoculation, injection. The dose is the same. And what's uh, important is that uh, Many patients, progressively, especially in India, have been developing resistance to these antimonials. And the rate in some places is only 30% efficacy. 
because uh, different factors, but mainly, uh, as I mentioned the first day, that some doctors that are not real doctors, but we call the quacks, they go from village to village, they have the drug in the pocket, and they say, oh, you have tell us how many, how many pips you want, or how many uh, computes you want, give me the money, I give you. And they go and they receive part of the treatment, the interval treatment, and that's an ideal condition to become resistant to the drug. Uh, in addition, it's relatively painful injection, there's some toxicity. And uh, if we move uh, chronologically, the second one to be uh, developed at the uh, mitrephosine, that was at the time a revolution because the first oral drug and uh, a lot of hope um, was created with this uh, mitrephosine drug. You see that the efficacy, and we will come back to that in different opportunities, between uh, India or Indian subcontinent and Africa is very different. We have a very high efficacy in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, but less in Africa. And uh, one of the main limitations is the teratogenic uh, risk. It's completely contraindicated in the pregnant woman. And uh, for the child bearing age woman, you need contraception. Otherwise, it's ethical, unac ethically unacceptable to give mitrephosine. And I've seen some places the the guy at the primary healthcare level, they, oh no, doctor, for me, it's not a problem. I don't look if it's a woman or man. But I say, my definition of which drug I have to give is in relation with the size of the spleen. It's a big spleen, that a small spleen. Not at all any idea of the risk to give methotrexine to the woman. But that occurs sometimes. Then, uh, paramomycin came on the pipeline. It's an old drug that has been reactivated. The technology has been transferred to India to reduce the cost. And it's also intramuscularly injection. Um, the dose is well different. And here is also a perfect illustration of the different activity, efficacy between India and Africa. You see the numbers are really different. But it's also injectable intramuscularly. There's some nephrotoxicity hepatotoxicity, autotoxicity, but reversible. Google is this thing, it's not, it's not because you inject paromacin that people cannot hear anymore. <laughs> For a period of time, they have uh, some problems with it. And at the end, more recently, also almost the magic bullet was the amphotericin B included in liposomes. There are different uh, lipidic structures to put uh, the amphotericin B uh, inside. This is the best because you have a very low side effect. We will see you have a target effect on the macrophages in the liver in spleen. But that's a very good drug. Uh, you know that traditionally the amphotericin B desoxycholate, the first one to be, that has been used for years, had um, a severe toxicity in terms of uh, hypokalemia, uh, nephrotoxicity. What the, the one I mentioned here, but they, they are very minor with the ambiso. But they were very severe contradiction, limitation in the administration on amphotericin B. But during years, that was the unique drug used, especially in Asia. Let's go further. Now that we, okay, put the synthesis uh, upstairs. Variable efficacy, serious toxicities, only one oral drug. The others are painful injection. And um, it's not <coughs> convenient to have uh, really one major drug because it's uh, one pharmaceutical company and the risk of uh, interruption of production, we should get more drugs. That's clearly the message we have to deliver. During the last uh, 14 years, more or less, that's the progression that has been very interesting in terms of drug development. You see, when there is a political commitment, uh, between, uh, for example, the international organization at WHO and also, of course, the ministries of the developing countries, things are moving. You see, in, in a relatively low, uh, short period of time, we have been uh, at the WHO level, the definition of uh, NTDs and priority given to uh, neglect tropical disease. Our department at WHO was 
called uh, communicable disease, and now it's NTD that has been a, a priority given to this uh, neglected tropical disease. And then there have been more action, we will see, and more recently the London Declaration that's been uh, strengthening this decision to uh, fight and control uh, NTDs. Simultaneously, we got uh, the Memorandum of Understanding signed by the Minister of Nepal, India, Bangladesh in 2005. Uh, it was a great uh, milestone. Then WHO, during the, the World Health Assembly, made a resolution to eliminate leishmaniasis. We had in 2012-2011 an, an expert committee. That's really the function of, of WHO, International Organization. You bring people from the, around the world, experts, and in one week time, you can get a clear recommendation what to do, and that goes to the country. Then it's a very uh, nice uh, function of WHO. Then my colleague, Dr. Alba, organized the WHO Expert Committee in 2011 12, and we got the, what we call the Blue Book, it's not the right book, <laughs> the Blue Book, on the recommendation from the Expert Committee where you have all the details in terms of diagnosis, treatment, and other activities. But you see commitment from both sides, from uh, the countries and from the WHO that has made possible the registration of miltefosin in 2002. Um, I would say that's the typical uh, difficulties we got at that time, that miltefosin was released by the pharmaceutical company with no control, especially in India. And uh, that's a mistake, because they wanted to make money quickly. They said, it's registered, let's go. But it was almost criminal, because if you put a drug in the private sector, you lose the control of the drug, and you can waste all your efforts, because the resistance will come, the use will be sometimes very bad, wrong dose, wrong duration statement. And that's something that we have always to remember, be very careful in using the drug, otherwise you waste your investment in a short period of time. And then you have nothing, you have to look for a new drug. But miltefosin registration, paramomycin then came, and uh, I would say almost the magic bullet, the ambisome arrived, and that was very nice, because um, we see immediately the efficacy, the low toxicity, but the problem was the price, and I will show you a slide to see how the price was reduced thanks to an agreement with the company, Gilead. Then uh, many uh, trials start with combo, antimonia sparmomycin, imiltefosin, and then Siam Sundar worked a lot on single dose ambizone, that was a revolution. Then there was a donation and combo therapies uh, everywhere in, in the countries. And miltefosin, we saw that miltefosin were less efficient in, uh, in children. That was because they, they were receiving a lower doses than adults, not proportional to, to the body. And then allometric system was put in place. Okay, let's back to ambisome, our magic bullet. Yeah, you see the different lipidic structure in which you can include the uh, amphotericin B desoxycholate. The one selected was, as I said before, these uh, liposomes that really enclose the amphotericin B inside and bring it directly to the spleen, to the liver. We reduce sharply the side effect and you increase the efficacy. You see that has been, from the beginning, uh, a drug appearing as very efficient, 95% uh, efficacy, minimal side effects, and initially it was suggested to have this kind of treatment, uh, scheme of treatment during five days. But then Professor Sundar demonstrated that one single shot could cure 96% of patients at 10 milligram kilo. That's fabulous. It was the first time that inject, injecting somebody, you can say 95% of, of the person receiving the drug will cure. It was really a revolution. But the, the main limitation was the price. It was impossible in developing countries to, to talk on a drug that was 
uh, with such high price. One vial cost at that time 186 US dollars. But thanks to, as I said before, a negotiation with the company, the price fell down up to one tenth of this price. It was 18 dollars per vial. Still costly, still costly because uh, when you have a, a salary of one US dollar per day, it represents uh, four months uh, work. <laughs> but it's not cheap. But we will see that the company make uh, one more effort uh, with big donation of this drug. Here it is the slide. Scaling up of uh, WHO uh, donated Ambison by the company. And here you have the details of the different donations. There are huge amount of, of money. Gilead put more than 14 million US dollars. But you can say they are not philanthropic people, <laughs> they are pharmaceutical company. But they use Ambison for uh, opportunistic disease in HIV people. In Europe, in US, and, uh, they make a lot of money with the indication of Ambison uh, for different opportunistic disease in HIV positive people. They could offer the drug free of charge for, um, for uh, India, Nepal, Bangladesh because they were making money in other parts of the world. Uh, but that's nice, at least. Uh, and the FID make a complementary donation, also a very huge amount of money, to implement the drug because it's not uh, sufficient to have the drug. Now you have to deliver it to the right place in the country and that's more complicated still <laughs> than the first step. Okay. Then we realize that uh, anyway, if uh, Ambison creates a very low rate of uh, uh, complication and very low rate of resistance, anyway it will be good to have a combo therapy. And that's the, we argue for combo therapy, associating different drugs, because you can reduce the duration of treatment, you can have a cheaper price, increase the efficacy, reduce the toxicity, improve the compliance, and reduce the risk of resistance. That's really the key factor, compliance. Because if you have a poor compliance, resistance appears, as I mentioned before. If you deliver the drug in the wrong condition, with too short scheme of treatment, too low dose, you will get uh, increasing resistance. Quickly, that's uh, something that appears quickly, as I mentioned before, is the difference of efficacy between Africa, East Africa, and Asia, Southeast Asia. You see, for example, um, that's the contrary of the other drug, but the antimonials, we have less efficacy because the use for so many years in not very good condition in Asia. At the contrary, in Africa, Antimonia still works uh, well. Uh, but usually that's the contrary. If you look at paromomycin here, you have more efficacy in Asia, less in Africa. Miltefosine, more or less the same. And Ambison, that's very interesting to see that re very quickly we noticed that Ambison was more efficient in Asia than Africa. Okay, I think it was said uh, a few days ago. Yesterday I think by somebody, it's a uh, Multifactorial factor, you have the factor related with the host, with the drug, and with the parasite. For the host, it's clear that it can be some uh, genetic polymorphism. You have to take into account the nutritional status of the patient and uh, also the, the immune status. In an area where you have HIV, co-infection, of course, that's a very uh, drastic difference. And for the parasite, you have also the polymorphism, eventually in drug resistance. And for the drug, uh, you have also the pharmacokinetic that can be... We have not solved this question to know exactly why many drugs have less efficacy in Africa than in Asia. But it's the same also for uh, even the rapid uh, test. It has not the same sensitivity in Africa and in Asia. Look, it's still an open question, but you see it's clearly a uh, very severe difference of efficacy that we have to take into account. Then there's been a recent recommendation that are still changing a little, 
but the recommendation for treatment of BL in South Asia is clearly still an ambition the first uh, line treatment. And besides second line treatment, you have paromycin, miltefosin, and now there are trials I will show you, miltefosin and bisom. East Africa is for the moment still antimonials because they work well at paramomycin, but now there are trials with miltefosin paramomycin. And ambizom is only a second line drug compared to Asia with the first line drug. And um, then that's the very different entity. It's the, it's the zoonotic VL in uh, South America <coughs> where uh, for the moment it's still uh, antimonial is the first line drug. MA, I put megalumine antimonia, it's one of them. The other one is SSG, sodium stiboglucanate. Uh, one is called glucantine, and the other is called pentasam. Yes, some product. More. And they, for the moment, they still use ambisome as a second line drug, but it's changing. They are clinical trying to push ambisome first line, ambisome antimonia. So we we'll see that. So you see, relatively clear scheme of treatment now as indicated in this slide. PKDL. I mentioned a lot uh, uh, Monday on PKDL. Perhaps I did not make enough clear that the results on infectivity are seen from Bangladesh and support promoted by the NDI. But it's a fantastic team that has uh, got the results I mentioned uh, Monday. On treatment, uh, we are in very difficult situation to treat PKDL actually. For example, in, in Asia, it's a very long and toxic treatment. And people don't want to, to be treated frequently because, as I said, they have a just skin disease. It's not uh, beautiful, but it's not killing disease. They say, I'm not a VL, I just have a, a skin disease. Why? You, you offer me a treatment from seven months who uh, ambisome at 30 mg kilo, that is a very severe uh, dose. <coughs> Uh, Miltefosin is three months, Miltefosin, uh, 12 weeks of uh, injection uh, of oral drug, that's uh, fine, but uh, Africa is still worse. Because you remember that the difference between PKDL in Asia and Africa, in, uh, it's much more frequent in Africa, but it's self-cure. Most of the time, people cure spontaneously. It's very difficult to promote treatment, uh, long, costly, and painful. If you said that you could cure spontaneously, it's uh, at the limit unethical, <laughs> I would say. But we, we are suggesting for the moment, we treat only, uh, in Asia, we treat all the cases, especially now that we know that especially nodula, papular forms are infective. But in Africa, we treat just the PKDL when they are not uh, self-curing after six months and we have put a grade of severity and we treat only grade 3, the, the most severe form. Look, here also it's a crazy treatment, antimonials for two months and ambisome 50 mg kilo. The cost is high and, as I say, almost unacceptable. But what are actually the ongoing clinical trials? It's um, in the DNDI portfolio, all these clinical clinical trials are ongoing for the moment. There's a very interesting one, the first one there, that is a BL HIV. Oh, pop, pop. Uh, you see, I have no, no many slides remaining. <laughs> you can <laughs> resist to the sleep. <laughs> um, BL HIV, um, it is in phase three in South Asia and also in Africa. It's at the stage of recommendation for the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. Look, it is from the, the scheme of treatment that is promoted is ambisome more miltefosin. That's a very fashionable association. Uh, even you see here for PKDL in Asia, phase two India and Bangladesh, clinical trial, ambisome compare alone compared to ambisome miltefosin. PKDL Africa, Phase two in Sudan is different because we noticed that paramomycin is a good uh, drug for East Africa. It can be combined with miltefosin. But actually, there's a 
clinical trial comparing also ambison plus mistefosine. But really, ambison mistefosine are, are the frontline candidates in many places of the world. BL Africa, phase three in Sudan, Kenya, Ethiopia. Uh, again, mistefosine, paramomycin. And before, that was SSG, paramomycin, but progressively, if the clinical trial confirms the data we have for the moment, we will move from antimonial to paramomycin to miltefosin paramomycin. And in different contexts, different epidemiology, the zoonotic one with the dog, there is a recommendation um, to be made to the Minister of Health of Brazil, Brazil and colleague is here, uh, to move eventually from the antimonial, meglumine antimonial, that is the classical drug used in South America, to uh, Ambisome, or one is uh, down, is Ambisome plus Antimony. The, the clinical trial is uh, almost finished, and there will be soon a, a recommendation for the Minister of Health. So you see, things are moving. We have uh, not a fantastic drug, we have one very good, but still expensive. But at least the, the major tendency is to use combo therapy, as I said, to increase efficacy, reduce the risk of. Uh, of resistance uh, and reduce the, the duration of treatment. That, uh, what are the remaining challenges? Just last part. <laughs> um, pharmacovigilance, that we will never say enough, enough frequently that's a key factor to have a pharmacovigilance. Uh, in all the Congress meetings we say there is a strong lack of pharmacovigilance because you can follow the efficacy of your drug, the toxicity. It's highly needed, but it's always requested. There is no one single meeting where if you took on drug, there is no recommendation to implement pharmacovigilance. But unfortunately, even in India, it's recent. Uh, we, we have been in the Ministry of Health so many times to ask to implement pharmacovigilance. And we lose drug, we lose uh, in previous investment because we have not did so many. Anyway, I don't think it will change so quickly. Resistant versus relapse. It's also very important to define if you have a failure in your treatment or if you have a relapse after a period of efficacy, the patient relapse. And that's uh, crucial to evaluate the risk of. Uh, relapses with the different drug, we need to monitor that. And the third point, that it's a long-term follow-up of PKDL. If you treat PKDL, you have to do a, a follow-up of minimum six months, but if possible, three years, four years, because people relapse at very late stage. Okay? My conclusion, uh, I'm more on CL because I don't want to frustrate too much the people working on CL. <laughs> but you know, I will say, ah, the tradition is purely VL. <laughs> At the coffee break, boom. <laughs> I want to survive. <laughs> but any drug you have, you have to apply this uh, term of uh, what we call the 4A. Should be, the drug has to be, of course, available. When you need it, uh, the producer, the company, you have to secure. With paramomycin, we have a lot of problems. The company uh, producing a uh, drug, and then during months, nothing, and then back, and uh, it's a headache. And accessible. Of, the drug has to reach the place where the patient is. Uh, yes, the primary health care uh, level. Otherwise, the people at Greg Show have to make a big uh, travel and distances to get. But sometimes it is at the district level, but sometimes at regional level that make uh, the treatment very difficult. Affordable is, of course, the price. People have to, to pay the drug. Um, now, that's uh, some scheme with free, free drug available that has made. As I said the first day, we have m many more people going for treatment than to the treatment center because they know the drug is there and it's free of charge. That's limited the uh, unreporting proportion, people not going to the for treatment. 
And finally, the acceptable is the quality control of the drug. So that's the four conditions to get the correct treatment. That's the DNDI portfolio. It's a little complex, but it uh, should be, um, make us optimistic, even if we don't have many um, advanced stage for, for treatment. But here in the yellow part, in the drug discovery, we have at least four, we have more than 10 components for different chemical classes. We have four lead um, candidates, we have four preclinical candidates, and we have two clinical candidates. And that's a very new, I think, because the NDI has succeeded putting uh, several pharmaceutical companies together, put uh, what their library and uh, everything they have in not competitive way to say, okay, let's work together, we will see what uh, results in a positive um, candidate. Don't fight between us, uh, that will be better to, to go together. And uh, there's several candidates, as I say, from it to lead, and they put also the, what they call the booster, it's really the five or six pharmaceutical companies that put uh, all the effort together to push the the e to lead. And uh, here you have uh, some preclinical. I will uh, conclude on that. And uh, on the right part of the table, it's what I just mentioned now, the clinical trials that are ongoing for HIV-VL, for PKDL, and for VL in Africa and Asia. That's the ongoing clinical trial. On the yellow part, I will just mention something else. That's the different candidates we have. We have uh, the famous oxaborol here. There are several molecules that are uh, in the pipeline. All these candidates are oral drugs. That would be fantastic if we could get at least one or two of them uh, reaching the clinical trial, the phase one. Uh, two are close to the phase one. It's the oxaborol and the nitrimidazol. I won't go into detail the mechanism of these things just to mention that they are in the pipeline, the discovery. We have also uh, aminopyrazole that has been more complicated because there is a toxicity, important toxicity, but the problem has been solved now. And they, they move to really a preclinical study. The two moving to phase one, and as I mentioned, is oxaborol and aminopyrazole, um, nitroimidazole. You see here? Yeah the first and the second one. They are, they are starting the phase one, uh, actually. Otherwise, there are a, a good, interesting candidates here. It's a partnership with GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, and you have also DDD, it's a drug discovery uh, unit from Dundee University uh, in partnership with Welcome Trust. Uh, there's a very beautiful consensus to put all effort to to have a new candidate because still we, it's dangerous to have just ambition uh, as a whole drug. I like to take pictures, but I always ask, can I do it? And the uh, Indian colleague asked, can Dr. Deja take your picture? She said, yes. But she said, don't forget me and don't forget my brother. My brother has Kalaza and uh, do something for us. And we, we send the drug. The, the border was treated and he was cured. It's a nice story. But when I see this uh, smiling uh, girl, I always think uh, that we have to do more. When I retired after 20, 25 years at WHO, I, I had visited more than 80 countries and met so many people around the world. Then when I see her, I say, do I do enough for these people? At the end, uh, for the alleviate the suffering of these people, that's a big question. It's open question. <laughs> I cannot answer myself, but um, we have always, any field we are uh, doing research, doing control, that's our target. No? We never should forget that these people are waiting for some improvements in their life and in their suffering. Thank you so much.